Hello and welcome to this video. So this video is part of the class Introduction to Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning for Engineers. So today what we are going to talk about is uh, unsupervised machine learning. So this is going to be the, the first lecture on unsupervised machine learning. All the previous lectures uh, were based on supervised machine learning. So as a reminder, uh, what we saw uh, so far uh, were some uh, example of supervised uh, machine learning. So we saw uh, two examples of supervised machine learning. We saw an example uh, of regression with um, linear regression, polynomial regression. We saw uh, artificial neural network, which is another uh, algorithm that can be used for regression. And then we, used, we saw an example of classification by uh, the example of logistic regression. And in this case, um, the idea is still the same. Uh, you have some uh, inputs and you want to map them to a given output. So if this output is a, a continuous number that can continuously change, then that's a regression problem. If the output can only take discrete values, then that's a classification problem. But here, the main idea of supervised machine learning is that you have a certain numbers of features that can describe your observation and then you have some uh, some label you have uh, some label and this is what you want to predict you want to find a way to predict the label as a function of the features in the case of unsupervised uh, machine machine learning the main difference is that there is no uh, label so you only have some observation x you only have some uh, some features but there is no observation in this case that being said, uh, if, if the goal of supervised machine learning is to predict the label as a function of the features, here in, supervised, in unsupervised machine learning, you still want to be able to, to make some prediction or to find some um, uh, useful structure about the data. So the goal of, mach of unsupervised machine learning is going to be to analyze those features and find some structure within those data find uh, the way those data are grouped with each other or find some uh, some useful information about the way the data are structured or the way the data are organized so just to make it clear let's uh, summarize the difference between um, supervised uh, versus unsupervised uh, machine learning so let's take an example where you have two features so let's assume that you have uh, some given observation and those observations can be described with some features x1 and x2 so in the case of uh, supervised machine learning what you would have is um, different uh, observations so different value different data points and for each of those for each of those observations you get uh, some features. So for every time you have a given observation, you have its feature uh, x1 and its feature x2. So then you will have different observation and each of those observation will be located somewhere in the feature space where the feature space is the, the space corresponding to the, um, the value of all the, the features. So the axis corresponding to all the features, the axis of all the features define the, the feature space and each observation has one position within this feature space. And then you have another information, which is the label. So uh, in this case, it's represented by the, uh, different colors. For each of those observations, you have a given label. So for example here, that would be an example where you have a, a two types of possible labels. So that would be um, a classification problem. And in the case of uh, supervised machine learning, so you have the knowledge of those uh, labels. And your goal is to find the best hyperplane that define that separates the the two classes so that later on when you have a new observation you can see on which side of the hyperplane it is and in this case you can say that i will predict that the class of this um, of this uh, observation will have a will be of class red in this case and not of class blue so this is what you have in a uh, in a classification problem in supervised machine learning you have some labels 
this is some uh, information that you use to train the algorithm and your goal at the end is to predict for new unknown um, value of those features what will be the, the corresponding label now in the case of unsupervised machine learning so you will also make some different um, observations so you will have a different observation with different values of the of the features and maybe it will look like this it will look very similar to the the case of uh, supervised machine learning now the main difference between supervised and unsupervised is that in this case in the case of unsupervised there is no label so for example in the case of uh, supervised machine learning you you would be uh, m doing a measurement for example you would be uh, measuring for a given concrete you would be measuring its uh, its strength at after seven days so x1 would be for example the the strength after um, seven days and x2 would be for example the strength after uh, 28 days and then you would have the the label where the the label would be for example uh, a family of of cement so for example the blue would be uh, a cement uh, type one for example and uh, the the red would be um, uh, a cement type two and in this case your goal would be based on the value of the, um, the features based on the strength at seven days and the strength at 28 days can you predict if it's a cement type one or type two and the way you will do this is by using some examples some training examples some previous example of concrete for which you know whether it's a cement type one or a cement type two and you will learn by example in the case of unsupervised machine learning now there is no example so you make some measurements you measure different types of concretes you measure their uh, strength at seven days you measure their strength at uh, 28 days but now you, you don't know the information whether it's a, uh, a cement type one or type two all you have is those data points that being said uh, you can even if you there is no label you can still um, learn some interesting features about those those data points you can learn some interesting uh, structure some interesting characteristic why because if you look at this with a, a human eye then you will see that those data they are not just randomly distributed they form two groups like there is one group here and there is one group here and this you can say that there is those two groups even if you have never seen any example of a type one or a type two cement like you you can see directly that there is some structure in the data the data are forming some groups so those groups are what we are going to call some um, some clusters where a cluster is a group of observation that is uh, that are close to each other so they form a cluster they are close to each other and that's one of the example of machine learning that's the main uh, type of problem that uh, unsupervised machine learning can tackle is to find some clusters uh, within the data to find some structure within the data to find within all the observation that you have to find some groups of data uh, that look like each other because the value of the features is close to each other so that being said there is a very fundamental difference between a classification problem uh, like here classification is a supervised machine learning and a clustering problem uh, which would be the case of on the right an unsupervised machine learning in the case of supervised machine learning you know already what are the different classes and you will learn by example how to predict for a new observation which class it belongs to but you know those classes from the beginning you know how many classes there is and you you have some example of value of the features together with the corresponding class so you have some example of x and y where y would be the the class number in the case of clustering there is no label you don't know anything you don't know you have no example of different classes you don't even know if classes exist or not you don't know how many classes uh, could exist and 
when you find um, uh, some clusters using uh, machine learning, unsupervised machine learning, then you don't know what those clusters correspond to. You just find that there is some groups of data that look like each other, but you don't know what they correspond to. That, that's what unsupervised machine learning tells you. It's telling you some groups of data that look like each other, but without any knowledge about what those groups actually are. So there is a various example of cases where unsupervised machine learning can be useful. Unsupervised machine learning has a lot of um, potential applications because in many cases we have some data available but we don't have the corresponding label. And when we have some data that are unlabeled, then the only thing we can do is to uh, apply unsupervised machine learning because supervised machine learning necessarily requires uh, a label. It requires an output. When there is no output, then that's a case for unsupervised machine learning. So some potential application of unsupervised machine learning, the, the, the most uh, used application, at least in the industry, is to find some groups of customer that look like each other. So for example, if you, have, if you are um, the owner of a supermarket, then, uh, and let's assume that you gather some information about what the, um, the customer buy, and so you look at the, the different types of purchase of the, of the customer, and then you try to see, can you group the customers based on different clusters, different groups of clusters, so that's uh, market segmentation. And for this, uh, you don't know what those groups are, you don't necessarily know how many groups of customers there are, you don't know, uh, like when you have some data, you don't know if this customer is a young person, or an old person. Um, you just see what they bought. So you just see some features, some signature of those customers based on what they bought, but the, you don't know what, what is the class of those customers. That being said, um, if, you, if you look at this, then you realize that there is uh, some groups of customers that tend to buy similar things, um, so certain types of food, and maybe some other types of customers that tend to buy uh, some other things, like maybe other types of uh, drinks, other types of foods. And based on this, you can define some groups of customers that tend to buy uh, similar products. And maybe those customers uh, actually belong to different classes. Like maybe though you have some young customer that will buy uh, some specific types of food and may maybe some other older customer will tend to buy different types of food. So you don't know which one are, your, are the young one or which one are the old one. You can use your intuition to, um, to, to figure out this, but the machine learning algorithm will not tell you that. It will just group the customer into different clusters of customer that looks like each other. And if you have this information, then it, this is something that can be very useful because if you can group the customer, then you can target customer with different types of uh, promotions or targeted sales or uh, you, by knowing this information about the customer, then you can adjust um, the way uh, you, you treat them depending on the, the groups of customer they, they belong to. And that's something that can be used to make some predictions because if you have an existing group of customer um, and then you find that there's another customer that look like this group, then you can predict how this customer is going to behave in the future because it belongs to uh, an existing group. So if you know how this group is behaving, then it means that this new customer that looks like previous customer will also behave uh, in, a, in a similar fashion. So you can predict the, the behavior of customer based on the, the group they belong to. Some other examples are uh, social networks. For example, if you analyze uh, what people like uh, on Facebook or what they share or the kind of uh, activities they do, then you can group people into different circles or different communities. And again, you, you, this, this can be, uh, these types of clustering can be used to create different types of communities of customer, uh, different types of communities of, um, of people on uh, social networks that then can be grouped together uh, because they share maybe some common interest or they share some, um, some similarities in the way they behave on the, the social network.
other example, uh, for example, groups of cities, if you just uh, analyze, you, you, you measure different types of features about those cities, like the population, the wealth, the, the area, uh, like the, the growth rate, or different types of, uh, you, you define a fingerprint of this, of this city by measuring different characteristics, different features of this city. And based on this, you can do a clustering analysis to group those cities into different clusters of city that look like each other. And again, you can use this to make some prediction because if uh, then uh, you, you know that certain cities behave in a given way, uh, if you have another city that belongs to the same group, then it's very likely that they are going to behave or, uh, in a similar fashion or that this city is going to develop in a similar fashion. Uh, other example is, uh, for example, um, viruses or um, uh, like other types of um, uh, sickness like this. For example, in the case of viruses, you can group viruses into different clusters of viruses based on their uh, sequence, based on their, their genome. Um, and just by looking at the, 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 the DNA or the, the RNA of those, of those viruses, then you can uh, look like how much they look like each other or how much they differ from each other and groups viruses into different clusters to define some uh, some families of viruses that uh, either can have a common origin uh, based, based on the fact that they look like each other or that uh, uh, viruses that will may maybe behave in a, different, a, a similar fashion or will have the same effect on the on the the host they they infest or the, th those um, those kind of things you can group the viruses into different clusters and based on the, those clusters make some predictions about how the the viruses is going to behave uh, or those those kind of things uh, last example is um, uh, anomaly detection so for example if you find that uh, you 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 look at um, different observations, uh, for example, that could be um, the way uh, a customer is using its credit card. So you, you can uh, look at a given customer and see that it tends to use its credit card for uh, this amount of uh, of dollars, and he used this credit card into uh, a given area at a given time of the day, etc. So those are the features that define the, the fingerprint of this customer. And then if uh, at, at some point you find that this credit card is used in a very different way, a way that is not closed um, to the typical way that this uh, credit card is used, like maybe at a very different time of the day, or maybe in a different location, or maybe for a different amount than the, the typical amounts that the, the customer is usually paying, then this would be uh, an anomaly. And in this case, that could be considered as an unsupervised machine learning algorithm, which is to define uh, to, to identify when you have an anomaly, when you have a data point that look very different from the, the, the previous examples that, that you have. Uh, and in this case, it's, um, you are not trying to predict whether it's a normal or a normal uh, use of the credit card because you don't necessarily have some previous example of normal and abnormal use of this credit card. You don't have any label. You don't know what is a normal usage and what is a not normal usage. But uh, if you find uh, a new use of this credit card that look very different from the previous usage, then you can make some assumption that maybe this is a fraud, that maybe this credit card has been stolen and that somebody else is using the, the credit card and that it's not the customer because it doesn't follow the typical fingerprint, uh, the typical cluster of this of this customer. So that in that case, that would be an example where you detect an anomalous behavior, not because you know what this anomalous behavior is, is looking like. Uh, you don't know what an anomalous behavior would look like uh, but you can you just know it's very different from the the previous use of this credit card so you can uh, flag this as a potential uh, anomaly uh, flag this as a potential fraud and then contact the customer to check if it was actually him who used this credit card or if it was somebody else so in practice unsupervised machine learning is probably not as much used as supervised machine learning because 
there is there has been much more, much more progress in supervised machine learning over the the past decades than in unsupervised machine learning because unsupervised machine learning is much more challenging because you don't know the output so it's much more challenging to find some structure in the data when you don't know the, the what the output is you don't know what you're looking for you have some data you want to group them you want to find some structure in the data but you don't know exactly what you're looking for because you don't know what you should predict so in that sense supervised machine learning is much easier because you have a clear goal which is to predict a given output unsupervised machine learning is much more challenging that being said it's also potentially uh, more uh, rewarding on the long term because unsupervised machine learning is probably closer to the way human actually learn um, when they are when they are kid. Uh, when you learn as a kid, it's probably a mixture of supervised and unsupervised machine learning. Uh, it's supervised because your parents would uh, tell you um, some examples of things. It would tell you that this is a cat and that's how you will recognize what a cat is or maybe uh, the teacher will teach you some things and this is uh, this is an example of supervised machine learning you learn by example but there is a lot of human learning that is unsupervised for example if you just see um, a groups of animals in front of you then you can very quickly group them into different uh, groups different families of animals if you see some cats some dogs and some birds in front of you very quickly you don't need to know what that a cat is a cat that a dog is a dog and that a bird is a bird you can just by looking at them even if you don't have any label if you don't have any knowledge about what those animals are you can quickly group them based on the fact that they have different characteristics based on the fact that they have different size based on the fact that some of them have wings and some of them have uh, just feet then based on the fact that some of them ha have hair or um, some of them might look cuter than others uh, so you can it's very easy for human to cluster things that they see in front of you even if they don't know what those things are and that's actually something that is much more changing for computers computers when they see different animals in front of them it's actually much more challenging for them to group them um, because they don't know what they should be looking for they don't know how to classify animals based on the uh, features that look ob very obvious to uh, to human like it's very obvious for a human to differentiate a cat from a dog in most cases but for computers if they are not trained to do that if you don't provide them hundreds or thousands of example of what a cat is and what a dog is then it's very uh, difficult for them to learn this thing whereas for you as human you don't need to see thousands of image of cats and thousands of image of dogs to to recognize what a cat is and what a dog is which means that humans tend to learn much more by uh, unsupervised machine learning but that's something that is still very challenging for for computers to do nowadays so in this lecture what we are going to do is to see one example of unsupervised machine learning algorithm so a, an example of clustering algorithm and in this case, we are going to see the example of um, k-means, the k-mean uh, clustering algorithm. So the goal of uh, k-mean clustering algorithm is knowing um, uh, if you have some data. So you have some example of data for which you have uh, different features. So in this case, we are looking at just uh, in two dimensions, you have two features. And the goal of Kmin is going to be uh, lo by looking at those data to find k clusters. So k is the number of clusters that you want to find. And in this case, so the goal of this algorithm will be to find that, for example, if you take k equal to, it's going to find the best two clusters of data. So it's going to find that this um, groups of four data because they look like each other they belong to the same cluster and that these groups of data because they look like each other they they look like they belong to the same cluster but remember that in this case you don't know this you have no example no prior example of the fact that uh, those red data would belong to one family or, or that those blue data would belong to another family you only know 
their um, features x1 and x2 and just based on the fact that they look like each other you are going to divide those data points into k clusters where k is a, an integer number that that you can choose so what the clustering uh, the k-mean clustering algorithm will do is to group those data points into k, k cluster so and this one will be k equal one this one will be um the, the the second one so the the, the k equal two and um in this case the, the second thing that the, this algorithm is going to do is to give you the the centroid the centroid of those two clusters so in this case the centroid of uh, the cluster one will be here and we are going to write this centroid um, uh, c1 so the centroid of cluster one and in this case the centroid of uh, cluster two would be uh, somewhere here and in this case so for example if you have a um, different observation so the different observation we can write them xi where probably that would be um, x1 that would be um, x2 x3 and x4 uh, where um, the example for x for uh, observation x1 that we, uh, a given observation is defined by the value of its uh, two um, of its two features so if you know the value f1 x1 and x2 for uh, observation one then that's that that's that would be uh, how you define observation uh, number one so then the if you have the different observation corresponding to one cluster then the way you can define the centroid is just a, a way uh, the average of all the, the observations so you take all the observation i you sum them all so in this case there would be four data points inside this cluster so you take the the, the sum of the four and you divide by four so you just calculate the average so in this case x uh, would be uh, a two-dimensional uh, vector and then uh, c1 is also going to be a two-dimensional vector uh, because it corresponds c1 corresponds to the position uh, within the feature space in this case the feature space has two dimension x and y so x1 uh, on the x-axis x2 on the y-axis and in this case if you do the uh, the average of the the four points that gives you the the centroid and that's that's what the the k-mean clustering algorithm is going to tell you it's going to give you the position of the two centroid or the the k centroid since k doesn't have to be equal to two uh, it's going to give you the, the the position of all the clusters that it has found and of the the corresponding centroid of each of the clusters so it's going to give you among all the data points to which cluster do they belong to and then it's going to give you the the centroid of each of those two of those clusters so let's see how the the k-mean algorithm what are the different steps of the k-mean algorithm are um, so for this uh, here I have represented uh, a set of data points so this is two times the same uh, sets of data points just for illustration purposes and so the way that uh, this uh, k-mean algorithm is going to work is by following a different step by doing a few uh, iteration of the the same operation so the first step of the k-mean algorithm is going to be first to randomly place uh, the k centroids um, of the the cluster so you don't know what those centroids are just yet because that's what's going to be the outcome of the k-mean algorithm it's going to give you the the centroids of the k clusters but so you are going to randomly place them somewhere and then the role of the the, the goal of the k-mean algorithm is going to gradually move those centroids to displace those centroids until they reach their optimal value so in this case the way uh, you can choose the the initial position of the centroid so you have to first pick um, a given number of clusters so k-mean algorithm you have to pick the number k 
of uh, clusters. That's not something that the algorithm is going to find for you. You have to choose at the beginning a given number of clusters, just like when you are uh, using polynomial regression, you have to choose what is the, the, the polynomial degree that you want to use. So in this case, let's assume that we want to use k equal to because we want and we assume that there might be two clusters. So then you need to pick uh, to place randomly the value of the two um, the two cluster the two centroid clusters that 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 uh, you will have at the end. So you don't know what those where those centroids are. So you can just place them randomly somewhere in the the feature space. So you don't want to put them absolutely randomly because like there might be uh, very, very far from any data points. Like for example, if you, um, if you place uh, a given uh, cluster or centroid here, like maybe that would be a very bad choice because it's just very far away from the um, uh, where most of the data are. So you don't want to put the cluster centroid um, very far from the data. So one way to do this is just to pick randomly k data points. So in this case, since k equal 2, what we're going to do is to pick randomly two uh, data points uh, out of those m observations. So if you have m data points, in this case, m is equal to 8, you have 8 observations, you are going to pick randomly two out of those 8 um, uh, data points. So let's assume, for example, that you pick uh, this one as being your uh, centroid of uh, the, the the first cluster. So this is going to be your your centroid. I'm going to represent it by a red star. And um, then let's assume that you pick your second centroid to be here. So uh, again, those this is just uh, randomly. So that's going to be your uh, step one. You are going to uh, randomly place the the k. Uh, the k centroid. So you're going to randomly initialize the the position of the, the k clusters. So you're going to place uh, the the k clusters, uh, the, the k cluster centroids um, somewhere in the in the feature space. So again, I'm going to call them cluster centroids because at the end, those points are going to become the the cluster the cluster centroids but at this point those points are just randomly placed so they are not the centroid of anything just yet but uh, at the end those points are going to move towards the, the centroid so i'm going to first place those k points uh, the k uh, centroids in the um, the feature space where the feature space is just this space made by those two axes x1 and x2 so that's the first step second step is that you are going to assign each of the data points based on their distance from the centroid and by that i mean is that for each of the data points you are going to look at which one of the two centroids or of the k centroids is the is the closest so for example if you look at this point here um, it is the closest to this centroid here um, if you take uh, this data points here, it is close to this centroid. If you take this data point here, it is close to this centroid. Uh, but then if you look at the other points, like this point here is uh, close to uh, this centroid, this point here is close to this centroid, this point here is close to this centroid. And of course, the point that we selected at uh, as the the initial position is uh, infinitely close like it's uh, at a distance zero from the centroid so you do a loop on all the data points and you look at which one of the k centroids is the um, is the closest so in this case this is the the, the case uh, this is the step at which you assign um, each data point so you assign, assign each data point. So where the data points are the, the observation. So each of the data points uh, for each of the, the possible values of the features, you assign each data points based on the, um, 
on the closest uh, centroid. So you look at the centroid that is the, the closest and you assign them. So you color uh, each of the data points. You are going to color them based on the centroid that they, they, uh, that they, they are the closest to. So those points here are going to be now the the red the red points and those points here are going to be the 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 blue points because they are the closest to the to the centroid that is red or the centroid that is blue okay so that's the the second step so then you are going to move to the the third step the first step is that now you are going to take all the groups of data points so the the red group and the blue group here we have only two group in this example so you're going to take all the groups of points and now you are going to compute their real centroid you are going to look at all the red data points you are going to calculate the centroid of the red data points and then you are going to look at all the blue data points and you are going to calculate the centroid of the blue data points so that's going to be step three you're going to compute the the centroid uh, but this one is going to be the, the real centroid, the geometrical centroid of each group, um, each group of, of data points. Okay, so you have the, the, the K groups. For each group, you're going to calculate their real centroid. And now you are going to move um, and move the, the K um, centroid. So the like the k points that you randomly place now you are going to move them to the real centroid so you're going to move the the k centroids that you randomly place so far we call them we used to call them centroids but they were not really centroids they were just placed randomly but now you calculate the real centroid of the each of those groups and you are going to move them you are going to move the two points the k points to the position that is determined by the real centroid so you're going to move those k points to the the real centroid um, positions so let me show you what it looks like so now what you are going to do is to take all the the points corresponding to the the red symbol you are going to calculate the the centroid of those four points so in this case the the centroid is going to be somewhere um, in um, in the middle of those four points so it's probably going to be somewhere around there the centroid of the blue points is also going to be somewhere in the middle of those four points so it's probably going to be somewhere there and now what you are going to do is to move the 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 points to the new centroid so this point here like when i say the point i meant this um this uh cluster centroid here so this cluster centroid that you this star that you previously placed randomly you are going to move it to the real centroid of this group same thing for this blue star here you are going to move this star to um, a new position so now the the data points the observation points they don't move like those black points they are uh, those are the values of the observation so those they cannot move but the centroids are going to move little by little in this algorithm so now after this step what you will have is the red star is going to be somewhere there and now you have the the blue star which is going to be somewhere uh, over there so now that that was uh, step three you have moved the the centroid to the real centroid position of those groups so now step four what you are going to do is to uh, reassign the data points you are going to look look at all the the, the black data points and you are going to reassign them again to one of those two centroids because now the centroids have moved so now you need to reassign the points based on which centroid they are the closest so you're going to reassign the the data points based on which 
uh, centroid is the closest. So now the, the assignment is going to be different because the centroid are not at the same position that they used to be. So if you look at these data points, it is clearly closer to this centroid. These data points also, these data points, these data points. So those four data points are closer to the red centroid and those uh, for blue, uh, those points, they are closest to the, the, the blue centroids. So now you are going to redo the assignment. You are going to say that now those points belong to the red centroid and those points belong to the, to the blue centroid. So now it means that your definition of the blue group and the red group has changed. You have moved the centroid and because you have moved the centroids, the assignment of the points and uh, which cluster they belong to, this has changed. So now you will move to, um, to step five, which is that you are going to, now that you have some new groups, you are going to recalculate uh, the, the, the real centroids, the real centroid of, um, of, the, of the clusters. So it means that now you will look at all the points that have been assigned to the, the red color. You will calculate the new centroid of those four red points. So now the centroid is probably going to be somewhere here. And you're going to do the same for the, the, the blue points. You're going to calculate now their new real centroids, which is probably uh, going to be somewhere here. And then you are going to, to iterate. So you are going to iterate uh, those different steps. So step two and step three, you are going to, to repeat them. You are going to now move the, the points to the new centroid position. So those stars are going to move towards the new real centroid position. You are going to reassign the, the, the data points based on the closest cluster, uh, the, uh, the, the, the cluster they are, they, are, they are located the closest to, you're going to recalculate the centroid and you are going to iterate those two steps. So the two steps, the two key steps that you will need to iterate several times is, so step two, step two is um, the, the cluster assignment. So that's the step where you have the clusters uh, sorry, the, the step two is the, um, the, yeah, the assignment to the different cluster. So you look at the different points and you assign them to a given cluster. So that's the step of cluster assignment. And then you have um, step three, which is the step at which you calculate the new real clusters and you move the stars, you move the clusters to their real position. So that's the step of the, the centroid uh, displacement. Okay, so that's the two steps um, that you are going to, to repeat, step A and step B. Cluster assignment, so you, um, you assign based on the position of the centroid. The centroid are fixed at this step. Centroid are fixed. So based on the, the, the fixed centroid, you decide uh, for each point which cluster they belong to. That's the step A. And then you do the, the centroid displacement. Now it's the, the clusters that are fixed. So the clusters like the blue clusters and the red cluster, they are fixed. And now you are moving the centroid. You are moving the centroid toward the, their new real uh, the, the real centroid of those two clusters. So that's what you do. Uh, you keep iterating those two steps. You fix the centroid and based on this, you reassign the cluster and then you fix the cluster and based on this, you reassign the centroid and you, you iterate. You fix the cluster, you, are, you, are, you, you move the centroid, you fix the centroid, you move the cluster, etc. And so you, repeal, you will repeat this until you see a convergence. So by, by convergence, I mean that the, the, the centroids are not moving anymore. If you find that the centroids are just so completely stable, they are not moving anymore, then it means that uh, you have reached a convergence. And when you use the k-min algorithm, uh, it will always converge at some point. At some point, it will just get stuck and it will have found 
some satisfactory clusters and uh, the centroids are not going to move anymore. They are going to be stable. So this algorithm will at some point converge. So once the algorithm has converged, then you have achieved what you wanted. Now, starting from all those uh, uh, black crosses, from all those data points, you have found two clusters or k clusters depending on the value of k that you choose so you have found two groups of atoms that form uh, clusters of data points that are close to each other and you have the the corresponding centroid of those uh, those two clusters so you have the the geometrical centroid of those two clusters which are the the two things that the k-mean clustering algorithm will give you and based on this it means that now you have found two groups of customer of two groups of observation that are similar that look alike each other so there is one first potential issue with the the k-mean algorithm is that at the first step of this algorithm you need to place randomly the position of the the k clus the k cluster centroid so you need to pick k data points and uh, place the the centroids at those uh, k uh, k data points so you need to pick randomly the position of the centroids that you're going to start moving uh, in this algorithm and that's a problem because the outcome of this algorithm sometimes depends on the position of those k centroids that you initially place so for example uh, let me show you with uh, let's consider the same data points so the same two sets of black data points here so if um, if you look at those data it looks like they are three clusters and uh, a good solution like what you would consider a good uh, clustering analysis would be to find that those four data points belong to cluster number one that those three data points belong to cluster number two and that those four data points belong to cluster number three that's something that uh, that would make sense uh, based on the visual inspection so you would think that this is the the centroid of cluster one that this is the centroid of cluster two and that this is the the clustering the the centroid of uh, cluster cluster three so you have the the three centroids here so this is what you would expect as a human so of course in two dimension it's pretty easy to just see with your eyes and to to determine where the clusters are uh, so for this you would probably not need um, unsupervised machine learning or clustering algorithm because you can just do it as a, as a human but uh, it becomes much more complicated to see clusters of data points when you have two more than just two dimension three dimension you can still see it but after that when you have more dimension more features then it becomes very hard to just uh, visualize the cluster so that's when you need to use a clustering algorithm to find those clusters and so in this case um, this uh, uh, so in this case k would be would be free so you 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 are looking for free clusters in this case that would be an example of um, a good solution that is to say the the the, crust, the clustering analysis gives you free clusters that indeed look like ensemble free ensemble free clusters of points that indeed look like each other because they are close to each other that being said uh, it's possible that based on the initial position of the of the centroids that you define it's possible that your clustering algorithm might give you something else than this ideal solution for example it's possible that it thinks that this is cluster one with uh, a centroid being somewhere here and that this is cluster two with a, a centroid being here and that this point alone is a, a cluster three with, uh, where the, the centroid would just be equal to the, to the point itself in this case so in this case it could potentially get stuck into this so that would be an example of probably 
a bad solution. And the way we know that it's a bad solution as a human is because it looks like this um, cluster one is actually made of two clusters. It should be separated as two clusters. Why? Because this data point here, the, this um, cluster one looks like it is um, it is uh, it is not a, a good unified cluster. Like it it is made of different points that uh, actually should be separate separated into two different clusters. And the way we we call this in the case of clustering algorithm is that we say that cluster one looks like it is distorted. The way you can think about this is that a cluster, if you look at a given cluster in the in the feature space, what, what we think as a good cluster should be some kind of uh, a sphere, uh, a, a three-dimensional sphere, for example, in three dimension, or a circle in two, in two dimension, or um, like uh, in, in more dimension, that would be some kind of uh, hypersphere. That would be an example of uh, probably something that looks like a good cluster. But in this case, if you look at cluster one, in the case of cluster one, it doesn't really look like a sphere. It looks more like a, an ellipse or an ellipsoid. And in this case, it means that it's a distorted cluster where you have some points that are very close to the centroid, but you also have some points that are very far from the centroid. And that's probably a, an example of um, a cluster that is not an ideal solution. So in this case, the the the, the way to uh, mitigate this this issue, the way to solve this problem of the the role of the the random initialization, will be to try to run this algorithm several times. And every time you run the k-min algorithm, you are going to pick different random starting point for the the centroid of the cluster. So you're going to place the centroids at different random initial position every time. And at the end, uh, you are going to look at what are the clusters that are predicted by the algorithm. And you are going to define what are the clusters that are the most or the least distorted. And in this case, you are going to favor the clusters that shows the least extent of distortion. So now the next step is we need to define mathematically what we mean by distortion so that we can quantify the level of distortion uh, presented by a given clustering analysis. And based on this, what you will do is you will repeat this analysis several times by just randomly placing the, um, the three clusters in this case, or the K clusters, uh, centroids uh, in, in general. And by placing those centroids randomly, every time you run this algorithm, you might possibly get a given answer. And at the end, you will just pick the answer that minimizes the, the distortion of the, of the clusters that are found by the analysis. So let's, let's see what we mean by distortion. So to quantify the level of distortion offered by a given set of cluster, what we are going to do is to define the, the distortion function. So this distortion function is going to be a function uh, j that we are going to call uh, the distortion function. It's going to characterize the level of distortion. And so the higher the value of j, the more distorted the, the clusters are. So for this, what we are going to say is, uh, let's define a few quantities. So we're going to say that for each, every time you have an observation i, where uh, each observation is um, one of the, of the position, one of the, the observation. Uh, so you have uh, m observation. So for each i going from one to m, you have a given uh, observation where the observation correspond of the to the value of the features x1 and x2. So for each observation xi, you are going to say that it is assigned to a given clusters. And we are going to call um, uh, the index of the cluster associated with uh, the observation i, we are going to call it uh, ci. So where ci is going to be the index, the number of the cluster associated with observation i. So for example, in this case, if you take um, uh, this observation here, it's going to be associated to uh, cluster one. So ci is going to be equal to one. 
this observation is going to be associated to cluster 1, this observation is going to be associated to cluster 1, this observation is going to be associated to cluster 1. So for each of those four observations, their corresponding value of ci for i equal 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, the, the, the ci is going to be equal to 1. So where ci is going to be for each observation i, ci is going to be to equal to the number corresponding to the index of the cluster they are associated with. So same thing, those three observations are going to be associated with a CI that is going to be equal to 2, and those four observations are going to be associated with a CI that is um, equal to 3. So CI is going to be equal to the, um, the index of the, of, the, of the associated cluster. Okay, so once you have this information, so this is the information that the k-min algorithm is giving you for each data point i, it's going to give you which cluster is it associated with. So based on this, we are going to define the distortion function. And the distortion function is just going to be simply the average of the square difference between the data points and the cluster they are associated with. So it's just simply that. So what we are going to do is to, for each observation i, we are going to calculate the square different, the square distance between this observation xi to the, the cluster centroid it is associated with. So for example, like the way you calculate the distance would be to take the difference between the position of the observation i and the corresponding centroid of the, the, the cluster it is associated with. So the centroid, we are going to write to define the position of the centroid by uh, mu. So this is going to be uh, mu1, this is going to be uh, mu2, and this is going to be uh, mu3. This is the position of the centroid. So for each observation i, we are going to look at how far is this observation based on its centroid and uh, the, the 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 id the the index of the centroid is given by the centroid of observation i so for each observation i you know the index of the centroid it is associated with and based on this you look at the for the, the based on the index of the cluster this data points belongs to, you look at its centroid. So based on the CI gives you the index of the cluster, you take the centroid of this cluster and you look at how far is it from the, the, the data points from the observation XI and you calculate the square difference. So this is gonna give you the Euclidean dif distances. You calculate the, the square of the Euclidean distance. And then you calculate the average of those distances. So you sum on all the, um, the observations. So you sum for all the observations uh, from i equal 1 to m, where m is the number of observations, and you divide by m. You calculate the, the, the average of the difference between the, the, the data points, between the position of the observation in the feature space, and you calculate their, diff their distances from the centroid of the cluster they belong to. And then you take the average of those square differences. So that's give you, giving you the distortion function. What you do in practice is that you look at each set of points, you look at which cluster they are uh, associated with, you, you look at the, the, the centroid of this cluster, and then you take the, the distances. For example, like this point here has a given distance from the centroid. So you calculate all the distances. Same thing for uh, the blue clusters. You calculate those three distances. Same thing for the green cluster. You calculate those four distances. And then you are going to calculate the average of all those square distances have uh, as average over all the observation. Let's do it uh, similarly for the other one. You calculate the, those three distances. In the case of um, the, the green 
cluster it's a near cluster of one so the the distance between the data points and uh, the corresponding centroid is just going to be is zero they are exactly at the same point and then you calculate same thing the the distance is here from the data points and its centroid and you average all those um, square uh, distances so in this case m is the the number of um, observation the number of data points that you have in your data sets x i those are the um, the observations so those are the the values of the um, of the feature for each feature i it's, it's this position in the in the feature space and mu is the the centroid of the the cluster um, of, uh, of the, the, the cluster CI, where CI is the index of the cluster that the, the, the data point XI is, has been assigned to. And so this one, this distortion function is simply the average of the square uh, distances. And now it becomes um, easier to understand what this means, because if you take um, the, the case on the right, then you see that those, uh, especially for cluster one, the distance between the data points and the clusters are pretty large. You have some pretty large distance here. So you will average a lot of pretty large distances. But when you look at the, the case on the, on the left, the distances on average are going to be shorter. Like the points on average are closer to their centroids on the left than they are on the right, which means that when you calculate this distortion function, here on the left you will have a low uh, distortion function, on the right you will have a high distortion function. So for the same data points, for the same number of clusters, k equal 3, on the left you will have a lower distortion because the clusters are more optimally placed. On the right, it's the, the clusters are not optimally placed, so you will have a higher distortion. So in this case, this gives you uh, a way to decide um, how to pick the, the right cluster. So when you run your k-min analysis several times, you place the, the, the initial position of the centroids randomly. Every time you will get a different answer. Um, maybe not all the time, but sometimes you might get a different answer. Why? Because the, the, the centroid gets stuck into a local minimum of distortion. So there is some kind, they get stuck into a local minimum and they don't find the global minimum of distortion. So what you can do is just you repeat this analysis by uh, displacing the, the, changing the random position of the centroid. And at the end, you look at among all the repetition you have done, among all the clustering analysis that you have done, all the repeats for the same number of, um, of, of clusters, but just you repeat several times with a different random position for the centroids, and at the end you pick the solution that gives you the lowest distortion. And that's the solution that you are going to give, because that's the solution that gives you the most meaningful clusters, the, the clusters that look more like circles or more like spheres. So the last questions that we need to talk about, uh, besides the issue of the initial uh, random initialization of the, the centroid of the clusters, is how to choose the, the number of cluster k. So remember that this analysis depends on the number of centroids k that you initially place. And if you say k equal two, then your algorithm will give you necessarily two clusters. If you choose k equal three, then your algorithm will give you three clusters. So the number of clusters is not gonna be an outcome of the, the clustering analysis, at least with this algorithm, it's gonna be uh, what you choose. You choose, you as an operator, choose which number of cluster you want to choose. So the question is, how do we pick the, the right number of clusters? So there is different solution for this. The first thing is that sometimes you know how many clusters you should find because you have some intuition about the, the problem that you are going to tackle and you know how many clusters you should be finding. 
And in this case, you can just choose the number of clusters based on your intuition or your understanding of the problem. Another case is that um, sometimes you don't necessarily know how many clusters there really is, but you want to find two or three clusters. For example, if you want to, if you say I'm going to uh, group my customers into three groups, that's something that you can choose. You can say I want to find three groups of customers, and in this case, the algorithm will find three groups of customers because that's what you decided. That's how you decided to classify, to group the cluster, the the three the customers into three different groups because that's maybe that's convenient for you. And then, um, then there are some cases where you don't know how many clusters you should find. And unfortunately, there is not very good and very robust solution on how to find the most optimal number of clusters. It's because like there is no clear mathematical way to define what is the best number of cluster. Like uh, when you look at the data, it's not always clear how many clusters there should be. Like it's not something that has a very clear, obvious answer. Even if you look at a given set of data as a human, maybe different humans will disagree on how many clusters uh, those data correspond to. Like there is some cases where it's just uh, a little bit arbitrary to choose one cluster or another number of clusters. So in that being said, there are some methods that you can use those are more like a heuristic method, so method that do not uh, have a clear uh, mathematical formulation, but method that can nevertheless allow you to pick an optimal number of clusters if you just have no idea uh, what is the, the best number of clusters to, uh, to choose. So for this, to illustrate this, I have uh, shown here um, some uh, observation. So those are uh, four times exactly the same observation. But let's just illustrate what the clustering analysis will give you for different values of k, for different uh, numbers of clusters. So let's assume that, for example, you choose initially k equal to. So here in this case, it's pretty obvious that k equal to is not enough, but um, sometimes it's not easy to see that uh, when you have more than two dimension or more than three dimension. So in this case, if you choose k equal to, maybe you will find that this is one cluster and you will find that this is another cluster. So you, you will find your two clusters like this. In this case, uh, the cluster red would have a pretty big uh, di di distortion. So that would be a sign that maybe uh, the red cluster should actually be divided into two clusters rather than one one. But is it enough to just look at the distortion? Uh, in this case, looking at the distortion is not going to be enough to tell you how many clusters uh, you should use because you can always reduce the, the, distor the distortion of a cluster by just separating it, separating this cluster into uh, different subclusters. The more you divide the data points into more clusters, the lower the, di the distortion will be. Uh, so that's not going to be necessarily a good way to um, separate, uh, to identify the most optimal number of clusters. So for, for example, here, let's look at what you would find for k equal 3. So now if you use k equal 3, k equal 3 looks like a good choice. If you do this, so you will find a first cluster here, a second cluster here, and a third cluster here. And that looks like a pretty good choice. Uh, if you look at the, um, the distortions, you calculate the, the, the centroid of each of the, um, of the three clusters, you calculate the, the distance from the centroid. So it's a pretty uh, low distortion. So that looks pretty good. That being said, if now you decide to go to k equal 4. So k equal 4 looks like it's it's too much, too many, too many clusters. Uh, that being said, um, if you do this, you will find that the distortion is actually even smaller. Why? Because now, so you will find this is going to be your, your first cluster, your second cluster, uh, your third cluster, and now you will have, for example, um, a fourth cluster that's just going to have a size of 1. And if you do this, um, and if you calculate the new distortion, so this one is going to have exactly the same distortion as before. Uh, 
this one is going to have the same distortion as before. This one is now going to have an even smaller distortion than before because the distance from the cluster's centroids uh, is now even lower. And this one would just have a, a distortion of zero because the, 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 the data points is its own centroid. So the, 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 the distortion function will be even smaller here. And you can see why it doesn't work because if you choose like k equal 9, then it's going to give you like each point will be its own cluster. Like if you choose nine different centroid, then each data point will, be, will become its, its own cluster. So you will find nine clusters where each cluster will be made of uh, one single point. So in this case, the, the, the distortion would be zero because uh, for each data point, it's going to be uh, exactly at the same location at its uh, as its uh, as the centroid of its own cluster. So that would be an example where the distortion is exactly equal to zero. So that shows you that looking at the distortion alone is um, and and minimizing the distortion is not always a good choice. The more you minimize the distortion, um, the the better your clustering algorithm look. But on the other hand, if you minimize the distortion too much, then uh, you have an example where like your clustering analysis doesn't mean anything anymore because if each point is its own cluster, then you don't learn anything about the data. So that's kind of similar to what we discussed about underfitting and overfitting. Here, when you have not enough clusters, it means that you are uh, not allowing enough complexity in the data point. So that would be an example of an underfitted model. On the other hand, here, if you just um, uh, create too many clusters, then you assume that the data is more complex than it actually is. So that would be an example of an overfitted uh, model where you just have too many clusters and you just don't learn anything about the data. It's not going to allow you to generalize anything or to make any prediction. So clearly, in this case, free is uh, would be an optimal answer. It's the best balance between having a, a model that is not too complex, not too simple with a free clusters. Free clusters is when you learn the most about the data, you find the right level of complexity to describe the, the structure of the data. So again, there is no like very uh, robust way to find what is the most optimal number of clusters, the value of k that you should be using. So that being said, there is some method like some approximate method or some uh, heuristic method uh, that don't have a very strong mathematical uh, formulation, but nevertheless can allow you to uh, to make a choice. And so one of those uh, methods, for example, is the elbow method. So the elbow method is a method that can allow you to pick uh, a value of k that is a reasonable value. So the idea of the elbow method is as follow, is that you are going to do this clustering analysis for different values of k. So you will choose uh, k equal to k equal three, etc. So you will uh, do, you will vary k, the number of clusters. Uh, so you, you, the minimum value of k is two. Um, and then you will vary, and for example, like, you can vary this for different value of k, or you can go up to the maximum value of k, where the maximum value of k would be 9, where k equal 9. 9 is the number of observations. So you cannot have more clusters than observation. And then what you are going to do is to track and plot the value of the, um, the, the, the distortion function j as a function of k. So as a reminder, we said that you cannot just pick the, the number of clusters k that minimizes the distortion. Why? Because at k equal 9, then necessarily that's going to give you a distortion of 0. So that, that's, that's not a good choice just to minimize the distortion. That being said, when you plot the value of the distortion uh, for each k, so you plot it for, um, for k equal 2, then you will plot it for, uh, for k equal 3. So k equal 3 is going to give you a much lower distortion than k equal 2 because k equal 3 is a much better clustering. Then you will do this for k equal 4, 5, etc. 
and for each of those things you will um, look at the, the the value of the distortion function that you get for each of the um, the number of clusters k and then so you will uh, you will plot what you get so in this case you will um, you will plot the the value of the distortion function as a function of the number of clusters that you use and necessarily the more clusters you use the higher the value of k the lower is going to be the value of the distortion so uh, that minimizing the distortion is is not going to be enough but the idea of the elbow method is to look at at which point do you start to see some kind of plateau of the distortion function or another way of saying this is what is the minimum number of um, clusters that you need to properly to have a, a low enough value for the distortion so again like this doesn't have a clear mathematical formulation but when you look at those data uh, you can see that um, a value of three appears to be a good compromise because it's appeared to be the number of clusters the minimum number of clusters that you need in order to minimize the, the 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 value of the distortion so the idea of the elbow method is you can think about this uh, you can think about the distortion function as a function of k as being an arm and you want to find where is the value where is the position of the elbow of this arm you want to find the position at which uh, you start with an arm that just kind of linearly increase and you want to find the the minimum number of clusters at which you start to have the uh, the elbow where the arm now is going to go up faster and this position of the elbow is something that again is uh, you need to look at it with uh, with your human eye like there is no clear mathematical um, condition that's going to give you this optimal value for for the elbow but that being said if you look at this in this case it's pretty obvious that k equal 3 is uh, a good um, value for the elbow because that's if k is larger than 3 then you don't minimize so much the um, the distortion function it's already pretty low at k equal three and then you don't gain so much more new information by increasing the number of clusters to four but on the other hand if you decrease the number of clusters to two then you lose a lot of information so that's the idea of the elbow method you want to find the minimum number of clusters like the most simple model so that if you were to use a lower number of clusters you would lose a lot of information but if you use a higher number of clusters you don't gain so much more new information so you want to find the minimum number of clusters that gives you the maximum information about the, the structure of the data so that's the idea of the um, of the elbow method in this case so again just think about this as being um, an arm and um, where you have the hand like this and you want to find uh, the position of the um, of the elbow here so that's a pretty um uh, not a very uh, robust method but nevertheless it's the method that is uh, very often used in practice in practice to find the most optimal value of k for the the number of cursors that you should be looking for with your clustering algorithm so in practice those are the, the different steps that you should follow when you have a given set of data you will first assume different values of k so you will fix k equal to k equal 3 k equal 4 you will fix the value of k for each value of k you will run several times the the k-min clustering algorithm by changing randomly the, the the number of the initial position of the cluster so you will fix the number of clusters but you will just run this algorithm several times with different random initialization for the centroid for each of the repetition you will look at what is the one that gives you the minimum value of the distortion function and that's the one you're going to plot here in uh, in this plot and so you're going to repeat this for different number of clusters k equal to k equal three k equal four k equal five etc and for each of the value of k you need to run 
several times the, the clustering algorithm in order to pick the, the best initial random position for the, the centroids. That gives you the, the lowest distortion. And then at the end, once you get this plot, once you get the, the minimum distortion as a function of the, the number of clusters k, then you can use this uh, elbow method to try to determine with your eye where is the elbow and based on this you select the the most optimal number of clusters that describe the structure of the of the data so this elbow method works uh, pretty well when you have some obvious clusters when you have some data points that that are not so obviously clustered where there is more like data points that are kind of randomly distributed then this elbow method is not going to work so well but it's also going to to come from the fact that there is no obvious clustering of the data. Like if the data are not obviously structured into cluster, then the algorithm um, uh, is not gonna work so well and the elbow method is not gonna give you a very obvious answer, but it just comes from the fact that there is no obvious clustering um, of, the, of the data in this case.